There are in this world two kinds of people, stars and the rest of us. Stars are the folks whose faces pop to mind when we hear their names, like singer-songwriter Valdi. He's got a home on Salt Spring Island, several gold records, a happy marriage, and that mellow sound. The picture that springs to mind is a man sitting on his porch, strumming his guitar, and watching the money roll in. Well, once again, we discover that fantasy and reality are two different things. In 10 years, Valdemar Horsdahl has received four gold records, two Junos, and numerous other awards. Performing under his nickname, Valdi can legitimately be called a Canadian star. The term star is something that's really hard to, to uh, come to grips with. Sly Stone says everybody is a star. You can tell by the way they come out at night. <laughs> Um, I am recognized on almost every street I go on, and that's a nice feeling. It also restricts the privacy that I have. There's a, for every rainy day, you get a day of sunshine, you know, there's, there's a good and a bad to it. It's, it's not something that I was purposely seeking, it wasn't something I was trying to get at. But the term star, I am a, a recording artist, I make recordings, and I am publicized. And as a result, uh, I am in, in a lot of households. That, that is a fame of circumstance. His success began in Ottawa, where as a high school student, he emulated one of his peers who could stand in front of the whole school playing folk songs. Baldi took up the guitar, first practicing in front of the mirror in his basement, then moving on to play small coffee houses around the capital. I eventually left Ottawa, went out to Winnipeg, and got a job singing in a bar. That was my first official gig. Six dollars a night, four sets a night. Clearly not a union job. <laughs> you know, at the end of the arrangement where we went to the C, B minor, to E minor section. You know, and I played music on the road for a couple of years. When I got to the West Coast, the, the scene in Victoria was not very active. And there were already the resident musicians who had the choice gigs down. So I would do whatever casuals I could get. And I was a bellhop for a hotel. And I was working in a kitchen for a while. And then I worked on James Island for CIL, building industrial explosives. And during that period, I was a bass player in bars in Victoria. There's only a, the odd lick. Uh... occasionally that we have together. By playing in a bar, you obviously are going to be accepted because the people are there and the music in the bar is wallpaper. It's like secondary. But I felt that I was doing well enough in that situation to get an accolade on occasion. And to get any kind of accolade in a bar, as some people don't think that's such a high level of esteem, but uh, I was really pleased to get it. And that, to me, was one of my first successes. The 60s was a time of, of real stretching out in terms of the not only the radio people, but also the, the recording artists. What are you playing? Are you playing music? The joy about jug band music was the bounce and the life and the immediacy of it. And it had a lot of ragged edges, but we always made it to the end together. And it was a lot of fun to play. And therefore, it was a lot of fun for people to listen to. And if someone played a lick that you liked, you just took off on the lick and went for a while. It's gonna be clear. At that time, Baldi was not only playing jug band music, but playing folk and pop rock as well, a necessity for playing in bars. However, music was about to change from the flexible style of the 60s to the more rigid, heavier sounds of the 70s. In the early 70s, Baldi was offered the chance to go into the studio, and in fact recorded a couple of singles in Vancouver, but they were never released. Then came the big break, the record that put him on the road. In 1972, we brought out Rock and Roll Song, recorded in Hollywood. It was a rock waltz. It was one of the few rock waltzes to ever make it on the pop radio. And it did very well. When the record came out, I didn't have to rely on secondary employment. I have changed considerably now since that time. And my roots, which were not necessarily folk roots, they were uh, rock and roll roots, because I'm a Centertown kid from Ottawa. Cut my teeth on Chubby Checker. And uh, I still like to rock and roll a bit. Um, that record changed my touring schedule and therefore changed my home life. 
and I guess you could say, therefore, changed my entire lifestyle. Because I was away from home for at least half of the year, probably two thirds of the year, as I am today. The schedule that worked out from uh, you do, when you do the prairies, you go to Winnipeg, then you catch a, a real early flight, I think like at 5.30 in the morning. To Kansas? We'll go, you can only get there by going either to Chicago, you gotta go to Chicago first and then go to Tulsa. Baldy is managed by Cliff Jones, who also handles Sherry Ulrich, the Paolas, Bruce Miller and Claire Lawrence. From Tulsa? Yeah, there's a train that's gonna go up. Tulsa, Oklahoma? Yeah. Unlike so other Canadian like singers, such as Burton Cummings and Anne Murray, Baldy has only now had his first U.S. album release. Although he does perform in the States, most of his traveling is done at home in Canada. Or there was a high school outside of Ottawa that was interested in getting me up around White River, Chalk River or something, which is only like 150 miles. This is another, another element of the star syndrome. As a performer and as someone who is traveling a great deal, my lifestyle differs than others. But I don't look at myself as being extraordinary in any way. So what I see in life as I go by, and I see a great deal because I travel so much, I like to reflect that in my songs. And that's probably where the basis of most of my lyric comes from, is just from experiential areas of day-to-day of -day life. The West Coast seems to have a, a straggler element to it on occasion, you know? Or show at 7.45 and you just automatically accept the fact the show's gonna start at eight o'clock. This is one of the worst jobs of being on the road, is making up set lists. Before each show, I like to make up a set list as well, and that's quite critical. A set list that will determine uh, a sort of a back door to fall upon if the, if the way I am pacing the show isn't working. I usually don't follow the way I write the songs out, strap them to the top of the guitar, but I find if a show is going in, in a direction that isn't working, then I'll, I will have an order of songs on the guitar that I know will work, and I'll revert to that. But I also like to wing it and go with what's, what's the feeling in the room or in the hall or wherever I am. That's something that affects the crowd here, you know. We what? have a game on tonight. The Russians are uh, ahead of the Canadians. No one wants to go watch anyone sing. No one wants to sit there. Uh, I watched the first two periods. Well, I don't repeat the same show twice, and I never have. That would get boring for me and the people I work with. Playing uh, four shows a night, four sets a night, takes a lot of strings. If I didn't enjoy what I did, I don't think I'd be doing it. Because when I get up in front of an audience and perform, and I'm not enjoying myself, well, that clearly that's not going to be broadcast. Like I'm, people are going to say, he's not having much fun doing that. Why did we pay to come and see him sing? <laughs> when I get up and play in front of people, I'm putting myself on the line. Each time I get up, and as John Allen said, you're only as good as your last gig. And so you can't take anything for granted. I wouldn't say that I get nervous or qualms or butterflies or anything anymore, but there is a definite anxiety before I go up to perform. And I think that's good, because that hones me out a bit. It makes me a little sharper and get better at what I do. The rush is the energy of the audience. It is very evident. There, everyone is looking and projecting into one spot, and that's where I am. And there's a lot of energy. That focus is quite strong. And the function of, of the performer in that space is to use that energy and send it back out to the audience so that there is a, there is a two-way street going on. Instead of just using it, uh, absorbing the energy from the audience and just uh, playing something introspective or introverted, I think it better to use that energy to get the audience off. occasion the crowd will not respond the way I expect them to and I will try several songs several patterns and just try to suss out where they are and what what is it this crowd wants but I don't like leaving the stage until I have won that audience you know, and on occasion I have to go through two full sets until finally at the end of the second set perhaps it's just because I'm leaving and they say oh wow that was great you know come on back
last 10 years, I've probably improved as a performer because of the type of venues I've been playing. I don't just play concerts. I play in small bars, big bars, small concerts, big concerts, uh, television studios, grade one classrooms. Yes, you do, yes, you do, yes, you do. Oh, I definitely have an ego. I don't think anyone gets up on stage in front of people without having the self-confidence to do so, without having the knowledge that he, she, or they are able to transform that energy coming at them into something positive and put it back out again. Yes, I, th I do have an ego. I hope and I believe I have it under control. That's for others to say. <laughs> Folks like myself travel a lot. We play in a lot of different places, sometimes for a figure in the black and sometimes for a figure in the red. <laughs> Depends on how it goes. Sometimes you have stormy weather and sometimes it's very lucrative. People consider that a star is going to be rich, is going to have a lot of money. Well, mine is, mine is a lifestyle of day to day. Not quite hand to mouth, but day to day. I mean, what I make is used up. Like most people's income these days. There's the, the residence, the food, the kids' budget, and then my professional needs as well. And it's, a, it's not a life of wealth that we have. What, well, let money and me get along. You've got to pass it up or you've got to pass it on. And that's about where I'm at. He lives on 10 acres of Salt Spring Island with his wife, Penny, and two Would boys, like it, eh? Teo and Yanni. Mm. <laughs> Penny teaches jazz ballet on Vancouver Island five days a week, and what with fixing up their house, which they designed themselves, rehearsing, paperwork, the boys' activities, and restoring a 1961 Nash Metropolitan, there tends to be little time left for everything else. Being away from home as much as I am now causes a lot of the projects I have here to pile up on top of each other. I'll get halfway through one, have to put my tools away and go away singing. Then when I come back, there's another priority, and that one that I was working on prior to uh, leaving, just it's second in line. Then after I leave, I come back again, there's another one, then it's third in line. So I find that I have a tremendous backlog of work to do. But how I'm handling it now is rather than coming home fresh off the road with all these fantasies and dreams about what I'm going to do here, I ask Penny to come and meet me in Vancouver. We go out and take in a show or have a meal together or something and get to know each other again on neutral ground. Then I get, when I get home, I, uh, I fit in according to the way things are going when I'm not here, as opposed to coming home like a bulldozer. Oh, God. Do you see what's happened? The deer have eaten, just snipped these right off. Look at this. They eat all the blooms one by one. <laughs> Penny's a really strong woman to be able to, to be part of a surviving relationship when the man involved is away the bulk of the time. And if I were here the whole time, I think I, I don't say I'd be a burden, but I would probably be getting in the way a lot. <laughs> Don't ruin yourself. Probably the biggest problem with this kind of lifestyle is the fact that I am a part-time father. I'm only here on occasion. And uh, when I'm home, it's, uh, it gives a chance for the kids to, well, they plug into me the best they can, but also they bring out their manipulative talents the best they can. And I'm only here for a while, and so they bring them on real strong. <laughs> and when I come home, it's, it can, on occasion, be a bit of a, a test. And, uh, I'm learning to survive. In spite of Valdi's laid-back image, he lives life at a frenetic pace, and although his home is in the country, his natural energy and sensitivity don't allow him much time for sitting on the porch. I am an emotional person, but I, I have a heavy blanket. You know, it, it doesn't, I don't get extremely, well, shall I say, I don't get excessively happy or excessively angry with ease. It's, uh, and that's not a choice. That's just the way I was brought up. I think I get angriest at bureaucratic mismanagement. 
which means that I could be real mad all day, every day. <laughs> Other things that make me rather incensed are uh, people's lack of humanity with other people. I see a great deal of it as I travel. I hate suffering, hate tension. I spend most of my life running to keep tension at bay, shuffling schedules around and whatnot. Uh, what I would like out of my life is just a continuation of health and happiness. I see myself doing it in 10 years, yeah. I don't know what configuration I'll be with. I don't even know if I'll be playing guitar. I doubt if I'll be playing bassoon. <laughs> so, if I ever stop playing music, well, no, I will not stop playing music, period. Like, it's part of my life and I will continue forever. But I might at one point stop touring. I'd likely get into a record production or into tour management. It's a day-to-day -day thing. I don't have a goal. I don't have a horizon that I'm jumping at. I'm not driven to get to one particular place. Um, I would like to keep my music as fresh as I can. I would like to keep our life here as exciting and stimulating as I can. Oh.